Are you set, Don? Yeah, well, I just want to make sure. That's okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to reconvene the meeting. I apologize for the lateness. We went over an executive session. Um, if we could all rise, please, for the Pledge of Allegiance, students. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you. And I would ask now for a moment of silence for an employee, Ann Cope passed away on January 30th of this year. Ann was a teacher at JFK Middle School and several elementary schools from 1980 until her retirement in September 2004. So a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Mr. O'Shanna? Might yes. I ask you for a few motions, please? Yes. So I'd like to make a motion to add uh, item, agenda item 13, student expulsion, to the agenda tonight. And that would make the agenda um, adjournment item 14. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Madam Chair, I'd like to move item 11B. One and two, which are the out of state field trips, to item six C, one and two. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so moved. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn the meeting over to Mr. Medancy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we have a, a special evening um, tonight as we have uh, two different groups that we would like to recognize uh, as part of our celebrations of excellence. Um, in attendance, the first group that I, and I can see some RSVP seating, so we know they're here, uh, <laughs> are Connecticut Kid Governor nominees. And I'd like to call up at this time, if I can, Stephanie Lawler, our District English Language Arts Coordinator. Social and Social Studies. <laughs> Promotion without a raise, I forgot about that one. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Um, so this year, all fifth grade classes participated in the Connecticut's Kid Governor Program. The goals of this program are for students to learn how government works, understand the role of people in the success of a community, the power of research, and the importance of critical thinking. In addition, the Kid Governor Program supports our vision of the graduate in the area of citizenship. It teaches students that their words matter and can make a difference. Students identified and researched an issue that mattered and created a platform. All classes in the district voted in the state election, but these five schools nominated a student to run in the election this past November. All students who wanted to run presented their platform to their classmates, and each school held an election to nominate a candidate to represent their school in the state election. These are four of our five Southington candidates here tonight with us. So you guys should be really proud of yourselves. Can we just give them a round of applause? So I'm going to stop talking now and let these students come up and speak because they are probably much more less nervous than I am with public speaking. Um, so I'm going to have their teachers accompany them up and introduce them. And the students are going to tell you what their platform was and their three-step action plan. Okay, come on up. Mr. Chavez, do you want to start us off? Pro <laughs> in this. She's done it once or twice, a couple of times. Just a couple of times. Okay, so good evening. And I would like to thank you very much for the opportunity um, and the privilege of presenting Mr. Danny Kidwell to you. And Danny was nominated um, by, in a vote by his peers this past October. And we're very proud of him. And he's going to go ahead and present his platform. You pull the mic down, right? Go on. Hi, um, my platform was on kids' self-doubt. My free step action plan was to set up a kind community 
day where we could all celebrate our differences and show how important it is to be ourselves. A kind note jar where um, you and your classmates could add notes and take one out when you're feeling sad or down. And the third one is to inform through a podcast or blog about the negative effects and how you can combat them about your own self-doubt. Now, this plan has evolved into a sort of kindness week at my school that happened just two weeks ago. Um, it was a lot of fun and it was a great experience. Good evening. I am here um, with, Elise, with Elise Brown. I'm very happy and pleased to be here to um, celebrate her and her um, successes as the nominee for Kid Governor at Flanders Elementary. Um, Elise was not, um, ran and was voted um, in by her peers to um, run for Kid Governor, so we are very proud of her and happy to be here to celebrate. Hi, my name is Elise Brown, and my community issue was preventing animal cruelty, and my three-point plan was to raise money to help shelters that rescue animals, educate people in my community about how to prevent animal cruelty, and support smarter laws for animal cruelty. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Andy Hubini. I'm a fifth grade teacher, and I have the very wonderful pleasure of introducing Thalberg's candidate, which is Ava Parador. Hi, my name is Ava Parador. My platform is about fixing food being wasted. I learned that more than 131,000 children in Connecticut suffer from food insecurity. My three-step plan was to spread the word in school districts and towns, plan a day to hold a statewide collection for non-perishable foods to donate to local food banks. And lastly, to have ca school cafeterias provide to go contain to go to to go containers so students can bring leftovers home instead of throwing the food away. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Taylor Albert. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Ella Reese, who's ha in elementary school's uh, kid governor candidate. So I'm standing in for Anna Pastic while she's on um, her maternity leave, but she's very proud, as are the rest of us, of Ella's accomplishments. So. Hi, my name is Elarise Lugwecki, and my platform for Connecticut's kid governor was to raise awareness of kids getting bullied for having a disability. My three-point platform included making a video to share with other fifth graders to inform them of the issue, creating a club for other fifth graders to join to help spread awareness of students with disabilities who are bullied, and creating posters to hang around the school to get students to join the club and spread awareness of the issue. take pictures because you know you have to have pictures we all have to take pictures and I want to read to you the plaque that the students all received um, and I just want to say how amazing each of your platforms are how different and how inspiring each of them are for all of us even the adults the potential that you all show is absolutely amazing. So I think we all need to give them another round of applause. Thank you.
And may I just say, our future is bright yes. with students like you. So the plaque that they've received is a certificate of excellence, having duly qualified under the standards prescribed by the Southington Public Schools, you are hereby awarded the certificate of excellence for the Connecticut Kids Governor School nominee, in witness whereof the seal of the Southington Board of Education and the signature of the Board of Education chairperson and the superintendent of schools are hereunto affixed on this 23rd day of February 2023. Congratulations for all you've done. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, parents, did you get pictures? We need pictures. So, um, if you want to stand over here. <laughs> <laughs> Did everybody get their pictures? Yeah, All right. Okay. Thank you. We have one more celebration this evening, so don't. So okay. I'll introduce yep. it and then pass it up to Jess. All right. So we'll get to meet and talk to the students after because we have one more group that we need to celebrate. Mr. Medancy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so last Wednesday evening, the Board of Education presented our budget to the Board of Finance, um, which, you know, obviously is, is part of an annual process. But unfortunately, the dates coincided with the uh, annual recognition for the YMCA and um, their annual meeting. Um, so I, I want to start by congratulating all of the honorees um, and thank them for their contributions to the community of Southington. Um, also, at the same time, we obviously want to thank the Southington Cheshire YMCA for their partnership with our school district and, and all of that they do. Um, but most importantly this evening is recognition for the Karen Smith Academy. They were recognized at that annual meeting. Um, and I had, well, since I was unable to attend, I had just prepared some brief remarks uh, for those from Karen Smith Academy that attended last Wednesday evening. Um, as I shared when we first learned of recognition this year, with the students of Karen Smith Academy in the school-wide meeting one day, that the staff there goes above and beyond to meet students where they're, they are at and often support students in, in ways that many would never know about or recognize. Uh, whether it's providing guidance, love, mentoring, structure, goals, or hope, not to mention the occasional material needs for students who may be on hard times. Um, this school exemplifies the words uh, often spoke by the Academy's namesake and my mentor, Karen Smith. The academy is where magic happens every day. Um, the staff there truly go above and beyond daily for the betterment of students. I've been uh, had several opportunities to visit the academy this year. It's a wonderful student body. Um, and they are here this evening, along with Mr. Levin. So Mr. Levin, I would like to invite you up if you want to say a few words. And if you want to bring those <coughs> students along with you who attended as well that, that stand by, that would be great. I know we have Tommy Dorsey, uh, Mariana Chamberlain, Abby Peterson, Ryan Levesque, uh, Marielle Conley, um, or Marily Conley. I, have, I actually have a daughter named Marielle, so I've, and Zach Frotten. And we also um, have uh, Zayed Raza, who joined us at the last minute. All right. Out of so, the bullpen. All right. <laughs> Mr. Levin, all yours. So I, I just want to take a second and say thank you for having us. Um, I want to thank the YMCA for their partnership and also for this amazing uh, recognition. I want to thank the Board of Education. Um, throughout the years I've been here, their support of the first Alta and the Karen Smith Academy has been tireless and has been, um, you know, always 100%. So thank you to the board for your support of our program. I want to thank Mr. Medancy, uh, Mr. Pepe, Mrs. Mellett, and Mrs. Cavallaro, Central Office, for their support um, and, and guidance. Um, it's, it's truly a wonderful place, and uh, I'm blessed to, to work there. Um, and again, we have these wonderful students who are all seeing 
academic success, making positive changes, and, and they all have exciting futures ahead of them. So I think we should give them a, a round of applause. Thank you. Mrs. Clark, before we proceed, I, and I don't want to put any of you on the spot, but I do remember when I attended a school-wide meeting that day, a few of you shared words out with the staff there. Is there anybody there that would like to just kind of share out what Karen Smith Academy has meant to you or what the, the, the relationships with staff has meant to you? And I realize I'm asking teenagers to speak publicly on the spot, so <laughs> if you say we're good, that's okay, too. No, I got you. you got it? Okay, thank you. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Tommy Dorsey. But uh, Karen Smith Academy uh, helped me a lot in many ways. Like I was struggling before going like anywhere other school I was at, and this school helped me like get better and like be a better person as a whole. So awesome. thank you guys. I have to tell you something. Mrs. Smith was my mentor too. Before she was, well, I don't know if it was before Mr. Medanzi or after. She's the one that encouraged me to further my educational career, and with her help, I did. And she's smiling right now <coughs> because she knows how important that school is. And I know she's delighted that it was named after her, but she's more delighted that you're succeeding because that, to her, was the most important thing, every student succeeding. So keep up the good work. Make her proud because you've made us proud, okay? Now, I have a plaque, because of course we have a plaque. Mr. Levin, I'm going to give this to you, to the Karen Smith Academy, a Certificate of Excellence. Having duly qualified under the standards prescribed by the Southington Public Schools, you are hereby awarded the Certificate of Excellence. Um, in witness whereof, the seal of the Southington Board of Education and the signature of the Southington School, uh, and superintendent affixed on to this day, the, uh, the 23rd of February, 2023. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Let's take a five minute, congratulate everybody. Okay. Five minute recess, thank okay. you.
Mr. Daranowski, Mrs. Carmody. Here's Mrs. Carmody. Hours. He's coming. Give him a chance. He's get. He's making his way over. Oh wait, we have a presentation. Okay. I can only watch you write it. Set. Okay. Is everybody back? Is everybody ready? Okay. All right, uh, next item on our agenda, I'm looking for an approval of the minutes of the January 26th meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, looking for an approval of the minutes of the February 8th, 2023 special <coughs> meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, now we moved an item up. Item 11. 11. Approval of out of state uh, overnight field trips. The first one is DECA for Orlando, Florida. And I think. Okay. We can make. Okay. Good, evening. Good evening. I'm Teresa Brooks, one of the Southington DECA advisors. And I'm Jacqueline DeValder, the newest DECA advisor. <laughs> Tonight we're here to request <laughs> approval for our annual out-of-state overnight field trip to the DECA International Career Development Conference. To explain a little about the benefits of this trip, we've brought three of our members to share about their experiences. Hello, I'm Alexa Lund, the president of Southington DECA, and I'm speaking on behalf of DECA members who have not yet had the chance to attend International Career Development Conference. Coming out of the pandemic, we've missed multiple opportunities to travel, but this year we are back in full swing with our state conference um, in person next week at the AquaTurf and ICDC in Orlando at the end of April. Last year, my partner and I placed six in the state in entrepreneurship team decision-making, and this year I plan to improve on that placement to earn a spot to Florida. This trip will be a a great networking activity and give me real world business and travel experience. On this trip, we will be competing in various business role plays as well as representing our gold recertified DECA store. Uh, good evening, my name is Eli Kulada and I'm the executive VP of DECA. And for the third consecutive year, my peers and I successfully gold recertified our chapter's DECA store, which has already earned us an additional three spots to defend our marketing plan on the international level. I had the privilege of attending ICDC last year in Atlanta to present on the DECA store, and I think this trip is a great experience for anyone who attends because it allows students to see what level of work is expected at the international level and network with people from all over the country and around the world. Plus, it's a lot of fun. Last year, we were able to see a Braves game, go to Six Flags and Top Golf, as well as go to the Coca-Cola factory and the Georgia Aquarium all while we were able to prepare and compete and present on our business plans. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kevin Dorio, and I'm the Public Relations Director for Southington DECA. This is my first year competing in states, and I will be, the, and I will be competing in the accounting applications event. Um, my hope is to place in the top three so that I'll be able to attend ICDC. This would be a very valuable experience for me and my fellow DECA members because I plan to major in business next year, and attending this competition will open many doors for me by allowing me to gain experience and make connections. It will also allow me to enhance necessary life skills such as communication, critical thinking, and collaboration. I'm also looking forward to see business in action in some of the biggest theme parks in the world. We hope you, you agree that our time will be spent on this trip and you will approve our request to attend. Thank you for your continued support of our program. Thank you. Thank you. So if I may, before uh, you entertain a motion, uh, I actually had DECA on my on administrative report this evening. And because we moved them up uh, on the agenda, I didn't want them to have to stick around to, just to, to hear me sing their praises. But I wanted to make sure to acknowledge you while you're all here. Um, we received notification on Tuesday the 14th of February that the Southington DECA store, the school-based enterprise at Southington High School, was among 461 school-based enterprises nationally and one of only six in the state of Connecticut achieving gold certification for the 22-23 school year and will be recognized during DECA's International Development Conference in Orlando, Florida, which was alluded to uh, in our comments. This is the third consecutive year 
um, the school-based enterprise in Southington has earned this prestigious honor. Uh, and it's interesting, you can see the through lines to our vision of a graduate, you know, as we recognized earlier the students that were kid governors and the uh, 21st century skill of citizenship and, and civic engagement. You can, you heard him touching upon the 21st century skills that they're applying within uh, the DECA experience. DECA school-based enterprise certification program is a rigorous process designed to help DECA members demonstrate their classroom learning in a practical learning laboratory and then translate that into meaningful outcomes. These DECA members are practicing important workplace readiness skills while preparing for college and careers. So congratulations, congratulations. to DECA for earning for third year. Now, before I ask for a motion, does anyone have any comments? Yes, Mrs. I Carmody? have a comment. I, I've been with DECA and watched you for years. We're going to have a luncheon Tuesday yes. together, um, Mr. Rosanna and I, which we look forward to. But what you kids accomplish and have accomplished every year is, is remarkable. We are so proud of you. We are so proud of the partnership that you ha we have with the businesses that are helping us and to the advisors. Thank you. We wish you well on your field trip. I'm sure Mr. Oceana wants to have a few words because he was very involved in that business department. Sure it's just it's <laughs> impressive because these are things that, as I've said it before for the FBLA conferences, I've said it for the DECA conferences, these are things that you're going to remember for a really long time. And these are connections that you're going to make and skills that you're going to develop that are going to last you a lifetime. You hear 21st century skills. Just the skill of being able to get up and speak in public is a, is a skill that most people don't have, although the, the kid governors today just blew me away. I, I, we said they were future DECA members. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That, that's, that's a great thing. But the advisors, you guys are doing true great work to get these students prepared for this sort of a program. But it's not just this program. It's for your future. So congratulations and enjoy every minute of, of yes. the state and, and the national uh, conference that you're going to. Awesome. Well done, and thank you. Um, I will entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the out-of-state overnight field trip as requested by uh, and recommended by the administration. Second. Any discussion? I still think it sounds way too fun. <laughs> so. You'd like to go, in other words. Kind yeah. of. Yeah. Kind, yeah. Of. <laughs> kind <laughs> of. Kind of. You'd like to go and hear them. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our second field trip is to Rome and Pompeii. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> These field trips sound amazing. Well, I, I was just talking um, to somebody uh, and Again, I was trying to think back to what field trips I had the experience of going on, and it was to churn butter at um, Surbridge Village. Okay. And that was, yeah, that was about crazy. it. So, yeah, well, it wasn't Rome or Pompeii. No, but, you know, that was good. Again. So would you? <laughs> I feel like making me go after the very well-polished DECA students was not, <laughs> not nice. Um, so, yeah, I'm Allison Forsman. I'm one of the Latin teachers up at Southington High School. And, yeah, we are hoping to, uh, it's been a little while since we've taken kids uh, over to Rome. So we did one in 2018. We were going to do one in 2020, which for obvious reasons did not happen. And so we are hoping to um, restart that program and give our kids a chance to, you know, the ones who study Latin to actually go get to see kind of the, the home base of that language and that culture and that empire. So. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? No, sounds wonderful. Wonderful. The itinerary was absolutely yeah, great, especially the eating places. But that would just be me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's Italy. You got to it, do it. Right. It's Italy. Yeah, it it just sounded wonderful, and how all the benefits to the students are just absolutely amazing. So thank you for doing this. So I will entertain a motion. Well, I think we've said it before. Oh. If you need um, chaperones, <laughs> you got some up here. That, that will volunteer freely if you like. <laughs> So, so I move to approve the foreign field trip requested by the SHS Latin Department to Rome and Pompeii, Italy, as recommended by the administration. Second. Okay. okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So moved. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Have fun. Uh, <laughs> we're only a little jealous. Just a little jealous. Uh, real life. Yeah.
That's why I'm upset about it. That's okay. That's okay. Okay, now we lose half the. Thank you all for coming. All right, next we move on to public communications. Boy, we uh, know how to empty a room. Though. Yeah, we do. Good. <laughs> We're doing a fabulous job. Mike, you don't want to stay? I, sure yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Something okay. I said. These seats are no longer reserved if you'd like to move up. Yeah. No, I don't think they want to. Um, communication from our st student board representative. Good evening, board. As promised last meeting, we sent out two surveys to all Southington High School students. One of them was about midterms, and the other was about getting general feedback about the school. 158 of the 2,000 students responded to our surveys, which were sent out via their Canvas inboxes. For both surveys, um, of the 158, about 40% were freshmen, 27, 24% were sophomores, 15% were juniors, and 21 percent were seniors, so keep in mind that the survey may not completely be representative of the SHS population. Here are some general trends we saw in the responses of the midterm survey. The majority of the 180 responses reported that their midterms were multiple choice slash written uh, response exams, and that was 97.5 percent, but 43.7 percent of the 158 students reported that they would prefer a more presentation based assessment. Of the students surveyed, many felt overwhelmed and stated that having more explanation or prep time in class would help them feel more prepared for their exams. Several of the 158 students believed that the midterms should be similar to college exams to prepare us for our futures, while others did not see the point in the exams. But there were also many students who did feel as though the midterm experience went smoothly this year. Good evening. Like we had mentioned last time, the Board of Ed reps sent out a general survey to gauge students' experience over the first semester. While there were an array of responses, including both positive experiences and areas of improvement, here were some reoccurring patterns that we identified. Freshmen seemed to have, be having an easy transition from the middle school to high school. Many mentioned increased workload or difficulty, but they also feel as though the teachers and staff were there to help them throughout the significant change. Several of the students discussed that they have questions and concerns about the BCAP program. This is our revised capstone program for this year. We would like to send out a follow-up survey about this capstone program to help better understand how students view the program and how we can continuously improve it. Students, please know that we carefully read through every submission. We thank you for your input and value your time spent on reflecting on semester one. Our goal is to send out more specific surveys when there's a high volume of the same topics to ensure problems and feedback are addressed. We already have been able to discuss many topics with the admin team, and taking action on the survey will be a top priority for the three of us over the next month. Thank you. All right. Um, <laughs> so um, some school events. Um, the Unified Theater Show is on March 16th, and it has a theme of friendship through TV shows. Um, the cast would greatly appreciate if some board members could come in attendance. Um, the Spring Fling Dance will also be taking place on Friday, March 10th from 6.30 to 9. Um, as a class officer, um, as secretary last year, I hosted this event. Um, a lot of students said it was really fun, so I'm glad to see they're bringing it back. Um, tickets are currently being sold up through the 24th. For ten, uh, for ten dollars each, and beverages and pizza will be provided. Um, the robotics team is also almost done with their initial robot, with around three weeks until their first competition on March sixteenth. So once again, good luck to them. All right, now until a lot of sports action at the high school. The CIAC postseason championships are underway. The SHS boys basketball team is playing at Hall High School tonight in the first round of the CCC tournament championship. The team finished the regular season with a record of 14 and 6. The team has also qualified for the Class Double L tournament, starting with a home game on Tuesday, March 7th. The SHS girls ice hockey team plays for the CCC tournament championship against Simsbury tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at Trinity College, while the boys ice hockey team 
uh, winners of six of their last eight games will celebrate mm. their senior night on Saturday night at the Cromwell Skating Center when they host Hall High School at 640. The Blue Knights are in competition to make the CIAC Division Three playoffs in their second season of existence. The gymnastics team travels to Jonathan Law High School to participate in the Class L championships tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. The girls are, are the number one seed in Class L. The wrestling team, coming off a fifth place finish at the Class Double O championship last weekend in Trumbull, has six wrestlers competing in the State Open at Hill House High School this weekend, starting tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. The boys and girls indoor track teams finished 14th and 15th respectfully in the Class Double L championship meets at Hill House High School. The boys' swimming and diving team celebrated their senior day yesterday afternoon, defeating Northwest Catholic High School at the YMCA. The team has a seasonal record, 9-1-1, to complete the regular season. The postseason Class Double L meets start in early March. The girls' basketball team opens play in the Class Double L Tournament Championship on Monday at Trumbull High School in, at 6.30 p.m. And finally, the varsity cheerleading team came in second place in the CCC West Division at the CCC Championship this past Saturday. Um, now we'll move on to reports from some other schools in the district. From Kennedy, they say, Thank you to seventh grader Emma Delvecchia, who is spearheading a community service project through February 24th. The project will help her earn her black belt in karate. She is gathering new and gently used cat and dog items in food to donate to Army's Legacy Animal Rescue and Sanctuary. Congratulations to the winners of the 2023 Geography Bee. Taking first place representing Team 8B, our Geography Bee champion is Connor Platt. In second place, representing Team 6A is Julia DeRose, and in third place, representing Team 7C is Lexi Forsmister. Thank you to JFK students for donating 364 pounds of canned soup during our recent Super Bowl contest. Students were asked to donate soup cans and bring them to their advisory, where they built a unique sculpture to help a unique sculpture with the soup cans. The soup cans were donated to Southington Community Services to be distributed to those in need. Good luck to JFK staff member Mark DiDomenzio, Tim Buffard, and Colin McDonald, who are all taking the plunge at Camp Sloper this weekend. There are several fundraisers held to support our plungers, including a week of themed dress down activities inspired by sixth grader Isabella Giannensi. Thank you to the PTO for sponsoring a visit to, from local author Sarah Elby to JFK yesterday uh, to meet with students. All right, and um, from Nepalo, the Nepalo the is pleased to have 14 staff members represent us at the Sloper Plunge this Saturday at Camp Sloper. We have already raised over $1,000. Students in French class at Nepalo made their own mass as they learned about Mardi Gras this week. All grade six students at Nepalo had a, la a visit last Friday from Alexandra Amoroso, a former DePaulo student. She shared with them her journey to become a published author. She has written two books on her relationship with her brother who has autism. DePaulo's annual Taste of Culture event was a tremendous success. We had multiple performances from different groups, including our own band students. There were over 30 participants that shared information about their country, and over 350 people attended. As a part of a recent advisory challenge, we were able to collect 925 items that were donated to the Southington Community Services. If you have any questions about the report or the surveys, um, please feel free to ask. Thank you. That was some report. Well done, but I have a question, and I can't remember who mentioned it. I think it was you, Uptaj. Um, was it, what date was the play that you asked board members to attend? Um, so the Unified Theater play will be yeah. taking place on um, March 16th. Okay. Just checking. Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, you may. Um, questions re regarding the surveys um, that you guys are administering um, at the high school to your classmates. Um, two things. First, 
great idea, excellent. I'm a I'm a big proponent advocate of it. Um, I guess my first assessment or comment would be is moving forward. How do you how do you get more involvement? Okay, how do you get more submissions um, from your classmates, specifically, you know, upper upperclassmen, right? That have that have been at the high school, not just freshmen that are experiencing the school for the first time, right? Um, and then, um, and so I'd I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, and um, I'll I'll ask you one more question, and then I'll let you go ahead. Um, I, I did hear the comment about mid you know midterms and the survey and and one of the question feedback right I think you notated like forty three percent of the feedback was in class prep time right and that two things that struck a chord with me one that it wasn't more prep time outside of school. It was notated as in class or in school prep time. Um, and I'd like you to go back to your classmates and, and let them know that block scheduling is coming. So there will be extended class times to allow for uh, preparation for midterms. Um, so that's really my only comment. And, I, and I'd love to hear um, your thoughts on, on getting more involvement or more submissions um, regarding the surveys themselves? Yeah, so in terms of how we sent out the surveys, um, a lot of times the staff members use Outlook, but students are more familiar with Canvas. So when we sent out a survey, we had the high school uh, school counseling department sent out a survey, and every all the 2,000 students in the building received that survey, asking them to please take um, the, or received the email asking them to please take the survey. Um, one, of, one of the things that I just thought about when you had mentioned the concern about the discrepancies in the grade levels um, was a lot of the things that we do in BCAP, which is the capstone program, is uh, very grade specific. So if we're able to perhaps put out a QR code um, or have the, in, the staff members who are um, overseeing certain BCAP programs for juniors or seniors prompt, cert, prompt students to um, take that survey, that could definitely give us a better gauge um, and a more accurate representation. But um, in terms of the data that we have right now, um, it was put out in a way that everyone can respond. So although there are some discrepancies, um, everyone had the ability to respond, and we believe that the data is reflective, even though um, only a little less than 10% of the, the, you know, it's, it's gonna be hard to get everyone to take it. Um, but that was one of the ideas with um, pushing that out in CAPS under BCAP. And okay. then and and. You know, and, and just in response to that, right, a comment, um, you know, think, try and think outside the box, okay? You, you know, you guys are students, all right? So you, so you know the challenges in trying to get your peers to participate in a survey. Surveys are only as valuable as the data that you receive and the participation that you get. So I would challenge you to, to, to be inventive, be creative, right? And and work with Mr. Krakow and his administration and it and if it rolls up to, to central office um, and, and Mr. Krakow needs to get the superintendent involved or the board involved, in, if, if we can help support that in any way, um, we're here for you. So, I, you know, I'm extending a hand, so to speak. Great. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and then just one last thing going off based on the data um, was that the 43%, that number that you were alluding to, the question that we sent out um, asked students by what means they prefer to be assessed on midterm exams. So out of our responses, 43% um, of the students said that they would prefer and would be open to the idea and would prefer a presentation or a project or a seminar or a more hands-on approach to a midterm assessing to be able to assess their knowledge throughout each semester. Um, where the, the, uh, the remaining 56% um, um, wanted the traditional multiple choice. So, um, you know, there's discrepancies in, in how 
they prefer to be um, assessed, and that's something we're looking into. Um, and we want to, you know, develop more focus groups to see specific feedback based on the midterms and definitely try and implement something. Um, we had a meeting with Mr. Crocker the other day, and one of the things that we plan on doing is going to the next SIT meeting with department leaders, presenting the data, engaging um, their responses to see if they'd be open to um, see how presentations or projects or seminars could be more incorporated into midterms and finals. Excellent. Do you have anything else? Thank you, students. Um, can I just make one comment? Sure. Um, we just, or I want you to know we recognize we have like the same concern that not that many people responded. We talked about it a lot with Mr. Krakow yesterday. So we also want to get more student participation. It's just figuring out how. Mm. Um, sorry, I just one last thing to add. Um, we also discussed like, as a student, I've realized that many students don't check Canvas that regularly, especially like the inbox. Um, many of those emails, you can see like just from the name that it's going to be about something like guidance related, and um, it might just be like like a reason for students not to open it unless it's like from one of their main teachers. So we did have came, we came up with some ideas. Like I was thinking um, on Instagram, um, there's all those student pages for each class. It's a much more. Um, I was um, we talked about it. And we thought it would be. Uh, like a good way to have the word spread out to each individual grade. So if you could have the survey posted on like these Instagram pages for each class, it would target like the upperclassmen as well, but also focus on the, on the younger classmen because each of these like a lot of the student body uses Instagram, so it would also be a really good way to reach out to them. Awesome. And and again, just a real quick comment. I I know that you guys have the answers. Um, it's it, it's just a matter of of brainstorming, right? And and putting a plan together and then executing it. And and again, if if you need the administration support or the board support in any way, I I'm I'm looking at this as as a plus value proposition. You know, not 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 only for you as, as students at the high school, but district wide and I think that this can be an example of of how the administration and the board can do a better job of of servicing our student body so you know it, run with it you have the answers it's it's just a matter of brainstorming and and putting them in play and executing and if we can support that effort we will Good. All right. Uh, next up, communications from the board members. Okay, that was quick. Administration, you're up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to pass down for you. I just a, I took an opportunity to uh, print out a picture of the newly remodeled Wall of Honor at Southington High School. Um, a nice shout out to Mr. Romano and uh, nice. carpentry crew of, of the maintenance department. So uh, it's got a much needed facelift from its original location and it'll be a source of pride for, for folks that uh, receive that honor and also I think a, a, a space in the high school that hopefully the students recognize more easily in terms of the contributions of past Southington High School students. Um, Along the lines of thanks, I also want to thank um, Annette Turnquist in the Public Works Department along with Tom Manager Mark Shoda. Um, as you know, we often share services and, and you know, reciprocate in terms of favors and staffing and whatnot we have in terms of sometimes we provide electrical help or carpentry help, things like that. Well, given the warm weather and the fact that the tar pits were open, Public Works was able to get some fill for us and they went to the high school parking lot and we were able to fill all of the holes uh, up the high school parking lot that had degraded over the course of the year. So uh, just a thank you to them for that timely assistance. Um, also this evening, a, thought, a shout out and thank you to Rick Campbell, Tyler Savage, Jay Baker, and the town manager Mark Shota, another collaborative project. Uh, what the project is a new AV system that we're, people are seeing this evening. So we are getting a little used to the camera panning and some of the new angles. So for those of you who are viewing at home, please be patient with us. Um, but I actually pulled up a stream for um, Mr. Oshana because he's sitting next to me and the clarity is fantastic. Um, there's new sound, there's new cameras, there's new control panels. 
Um, and Sandy is behind the scenes working on uh, working that equipment for us this evening. So thank you to all. Um, for Tyler, I want to thank him specifically for his persistence, Tyler Savage. Um, he, as you know, he's our network manager, has done fantastic work for us since he's come on board. But in this specific instance, we applied for a grant through an organization, it's called Pegpecia, and originally we were denied. Um, and he applied for reconsideration because he didn't agree with the reasons we were denied. And we were awarded $44,000 off of his appeal, which awesome. paid the board's share of the project, and the town picked up the, uh, the rest of the share. So, you know, sometimes persistence pays off and trying to be resourceful, um, and to Tyler, his credit. Um, Southington DECA, we spoke about. Uh, Madam Chair, just wanted to talk to the full board about my request of you uh, that we consider a district wide facilities committee and forming that, along with representation from the Board of Finance, the Town Council, and community members. One of my worries after the athletic complex referendum, knowing that we have the elementary facilities, we've talked about the hardening of the entryways, we've talk, talked about HVAC, we know we have roof repairs and projects and replacements and ma major paving projects. Our capital expenses and projects are adding up. Um, and I feel like this is a collaborative way to be very transparent with the other boards. They can, if somebody's t able to sh attend from the Board of Finance Town Council, they can go back and share with their bodies um, some of the major projects we're discussing. And also it allows us to keep all of these uh, projects on everyone's radar because as you know, we have to plan out far in advance for some of them given the costs associated with them. And so for me, it's something that it allows us to be a little bit more um, deliberate and systematic in ensuring that uh, we can move these projects forward as, as needed and prioritized. Um, another item, the legislative breakfast last Thursday, um, Mrs. Clark and I had the opportunity to attend. I wanted to thank Representative Poulos and Representative Cooley, who is, we used to have Representative Linehan. Francis Cooley is our, our new representative servicing our area. Um, along with, I believe, his Farmington and a portion of Plainville. Plainville. Yeah. Um, but it was great to have representatives from our delegation at that legislative breakfast. That has not happened in the past. Um, and not only that, both of those members uh, from our delegation are on the education committee, which, as we all have a very special interest on things that pass through the education committee at the state level because it often results in unfunded mandates. And we've talked about that for years, uh, but we were able to speak to a few specific items. Um, one item I spoke to and I've spoken to all of you about is excess cost and trying to consider legislation whereas if we, right now it's four and a half times the per people expenditure regardless of, of if it's in district or out of district. I really think for in district programs the threshold should be three time uh, the per people cost for the state to start reimbursing because it is an incentive for districts that provide the continuum of services that we provide. It's interesting, Mrs. Clark, if I recall, is folks were complaining about that 4.5% and the costs that are being passed on to them from these outside agencies, these, these uh, you know, outplacement um, facilities, and the lack of control. And I said, it's interesting, you guys, that's your problem. Our problem is we've actually brought many folks back in district. Our, our parents are proud of the programs and services we offer. The challenge we have is the cost that we've put forth to do that with little reimbursement or incentive from the state. So I would encourage the state to consider that. So along those same lines, uh, next Tuesday, Representative Curry, who is the chair of the Education Committee, along with Representative Poulos, are visiting Southington High School as well as Hatton Elementary School. And they're going to look at, uh, I have a, a little round table set up. They're gonna speak to our teachers of the year from the past several years. They're gonna visit a couple programs up at the high school and they're gonna see our continuum of services at the elementary school. I wanna be able to show folks on the committee what the work looks like in action and I'm appreciative of the fact that Representative Curry is actually making it as the new chair of the Education Committee, his priority to actually step foot in school buildings and speak to educators uh, about what's happening. So looking forward to that opportunity. And then lastly, I want to thank everyone who was able to attend, uh, obviously from our board and other elected officials, as well as the parents. Uh, we had a, a nice turnout at the parent forum that we held at Kennedy um, on the 9th. Um, I think it was informative. Folks asked fantastic questions. Um, which really, um, I think, set the stage, if you will, in terms of understanding the complexities that, that we are all facing as a community right now relative to not only the Board of Education's budget, but the town budget and some of the challenges uh, that, that we are forecasting. So um, I appreciate the parent engagement. Um, we do have the public hearing on March 6th, uh, with the, which is the Board of Finance and the, the um, town manager's um, presentation along with the Board of Education. 
And then we look forward to follow up work with our, our PTOs and our parents around any questions they may have. Uh, lastly, you may have seen the Q&A document that we typically create for the Board of Finance. I've actually added the Town Council to that now as well so that any questions that either of those governing bodies have relative to our budget, they're welcome to submit in advance and hopefully we can prepare information uh, relative to questions they may have. So that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you. Any questions of the superintendent? If I, I, just, I just one yeah. comment. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Verdanza, you did a wonderful job um, at that parent forum. And I think I think you ha you gave the parents a, a level of comfort to ask the questions that they did. And so I really appreciate that. It was very well attended. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Let's I just continue that more. I wanted to add for the district-wide facilities committee, the, um, the chairs, I've reached out to all the chairs for the uh, town council, the board of finance, planning and zoning, um, asking for a representative from their uh, council or board to, to join us so that everybody is on the same page and we all can, so just so you know, if anybody asks you, that's what's going on. And I believe our, and Zaya is still on the committee, um, as am I. Um, and I think our first meeting is uh, Monday, Tuesday. Um, my days are confused. So Monday, Monday or Tuesday. Monday yeah. or Tuesday. It's one of those days. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I, I just had one, yep. one comment. Um, mm -hmm. So, again, thank you very much for putting on um, that Q&A with families at um, Kennedy. I guess one of the hang-ups that I had, and it's, it's not meant to be negative. It's meant more to be a, a pondering question, right? And I... During the presentation, um, was it Erica mm -hmm. that was um, making? There, there keeps being this, the word of investment in the Southington schools. You know, again, we're we're investing our our yearly stipend or the budget, and again, an investment is you put money towards something and then you expect a return out. And you know, you and I had a Mrs. Discussion. Clark um, a great discussion about it, philosophical more like discussion. the philosophical yep. aspect. And mm -hmm. you know me again; it's, it's no secret that there's just like certain words that bother me, and it, it bothers me to refer to what we do as an investment because it implies that we expect something back. And while again, we could argue that we do expect something back, I think it's it's also key to remember that. Again, the investment in maybe one of our National Honor Society students is going to be far less than an investment in a special education student. And, you know, in talking with some of the finance board members and talking about talking with community members is how do we measure the return if we're truly referring to it as investment? And, you know, in, to me, it's it's an easy decision of well, you scrap the calling it an investment because it isn't. It's it boils down to it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to keep our students in district, regardless of what our reimbursement is um, for outplacement and and for special education programs. It's the right thing to do to make sure that we're trying to offer new and inventive ways of processing career choices and things like that. You know, again, I'm still. One day, maybe we'll get a CNA program or something like that in, uh, in the school system. I know this isn't going to be the year. But it, again, it's, it's getting out of this mentality of, you know, just looking at dollars. Yes, they're important. But I think it's, it's so important to look at the bigger picture of, you know, again, providing opportunity for students to try a bunch of different stuff to let Southington High School um, be a laboratory for these students to really start figuring things out. You know, again, other words that were brought up, um, equity, inclusion, and again, like while I understand the nostalgia of those words, um, you know, I, I can't tell you, from my experience growing up as a kid, is having those moments where you're alone and having those moments of, you know, kids not including you with something and being able to reflect on that and self-reflect as far as, you know, one of our young kid governors talking about um, self-doubt, right? Um, it's something that even as an adult I experience. It's like, am I doing the right thing? Am I, am I doing what's best for my patient? Um, not being included in something can be looked at as a negative thing, but there's positivity in it too in growing as a person. 
So it's, again, not to get hung up on words. You know, again, words have meaning. Um, sometimes they cut just as much as knives do. And, um, you know, it's just important for us to leverage that. And I think, again, if, if we are going to keep referring to it as an investment, uh, we, we have to figure out a way, well, how do we measure that? And, again, when we're presenting it to a Board of Finance, we have to give them numbers if, if we're going to continue to refer to it as investment. I think it's easier to say, this is the right thing to do for our kids. So, you know, again, appreciated the, the Q&A with that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Um, communication from the public. Okay. That was quick. Uh, committee reports, curriculum and instruction from February 10th. Yes. 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 All right. So uh, we had a curriculum and instruction. <coughs> we met. Uh, and I will start with that. So uh, Rebecca Savakul, I'm sorry if I slaughter that, uh, presented the SHS Industry Internship Student Help Desk proposal. This provides students interested in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, also known as STEM, uh, the opportunity to engage in relevant field experiences. Students will work with the technology department to hone their skills and apply them to the technology needs of their peers. Uh, the internship evaluation mirrors the actual tech evaluation for district employees, and this is a one semester class and earns 0.5 credits with the potential for a full credit. Dawn? Yes? I just would like to mention how you all decided that that was a course I should be taking? Yes, we, we do, actually. Thank we do feel that you Thank could you probably benefit much. from that. We all agreed. Thanks, Dawn. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> um, next up, Mr. O'Royan presented the SHS Industry Internship Proposal, Teacher Assistant. Students interested in the human services career cluster or related pathways will engage in pre-service experiences. The internship begins with training session that outlines the intern's roles and responsibilities and introduces basic components of teaching. Interns support peer learning in assigned classes based on academic areas of strengths. And at the end of the course, the interns will design and teach one lesson to the class as a culminating project. And this is a one semester class and earns 0.5 credit. Uh, Amy Zapone presented the SHS Multi-Language Learner Course Program Change Proposal. This course restructure for multilingual is for multilingual learners. Currently, explicit language instruction is delivered in a daily model, daily class model, sorry. Uh, students are instructed using a very uh, variety of modalities. The focus language instruction is based on the four domains of language learning, which is reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Students are supported in the transition into school, community, and culture. The proposal awards one credit for a full year and a half credit for a half year, depending on the individual student need. The class is offered to students who score a one for a beginner or two for early intermediate on the oral component of the LAS placement test. Um, Students will continue to develop their linguistic skills in a supportive setting. Instruction includes access to longer reading selections, increased academic rigor. Uh, it aligns, um, when possible, with English grammar lessons to support comprehens uh, comprehension of materials in their respective English classes. Um, students will also have opportunities to work on assignments for other classes with support. And Terry, I don't know about you, but I didn't realize there were quite a few there were different, like there's Polish, only Polish speaking students and right. Russian speaking, and it was interesting to know that- A lot of support were, for these kids. There really need. is, yeah, that only speak. Very well done. Yeah. Uh, next up, we had Dave Yanosi presented for SHS Physical Education One. It's a requirement for sophomores. It consists of four units. Each unit concludes with a performance task. Um, these are team sports, weight training, lifetime recreational activities, and racket sports. Each unit is to design to focus on the four C's. And Nicole Campincharo presented with Physical Education 2, which spirals directly from Phys Ed 1. And that focuses more on technique. And Phys Ed 2 skills acquisition to uh, creative independence and autonomy. So they were great presentations. 
Yeah, it was great. And I, I think we need to tell the board all of the things that we learned. We that learned a lot. That, that, it was fun. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I don't even know half of the names of the things. No. That, they're all new. It was a good and time. It's not like when we were in school. Yeah. Um, they've introduced so many. Gee, so what was the name of the one that we had never heard of? And they kind of demonstrated it for us. Um, can you remember jam. what was what it? What was it? Can Jam. Yes. Yeah, I'm, can I'm, Jam. You don't know about Can Jam? No. Oh, it's fantastic. Come on. Oh, Joe, I'm old. I don't know this it, it was. It was so much fun. In fact, we got a little loud, and Mr. Orion was, came it in. Was just, it was really a, a really yeah. neat presentation. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was a good time, right, Mr. Um, it was Peppy? Good. It was it really was, great. They did a great more. job. It, there, there, was, there is more. more. This there is Carmen. Do you know about pickleball? Oh, I know pickleball. all about pickleball. <laughs> I do. Yes, I know pickleball. About that. People, I can we get back that, to the report, I please? This I is a meeting. I bet you Mrs. Carmody has Come a sweet on. slice. I, I bet. <laughs> I bet she does. No, Joe, that one I did know. But no, seriously, Don, don't you agree that it was? Thank you. I mean, you're young. No, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. It was fun. We got a little loud. Mr. O'Royan told us to be quiet. He could hear us in the hallway. We got really into it. We learned a lot. Yeah, we had a good time. That we had was a good great. time. Um, <laughs> Rob Levesque presented a life-saving cer uh, certification course. This class consists of four units. The first unit is CPR and AED. A goal of the unit is for students to gain knowledge and understand how to provide life-saving skills. Which is wonderful. It's great. Mm -hmm. For an unconscious adult as well as a pediatric victim. The second unit is first aid and allows students to recognize signs and symptoms of a variety of emergencies and provide the appropriate care. Unit three is babysitting training, provides youth who plan on babysitting the skills required to take care of children and infants safely and responsibly. And the final unit was wilderness training, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And it provides a foundation of first aid principles and skills required when emergency medical isn't direct access. So like how to splint stuff, how to stop bleeding. Right bites of certain things. Um, so it was, it was really cool. We learned a lot. And I mean, this stuff wasn't around when I was here. So it was definitely uh, an interesting class. We learned a lot. These kids are really lucky. And uh, Tom Hinman, who's here today, huh? uh, my favorite subject, math. <laughs> got my father. Uh, the Not math mine. department <laughs> curriculum, my father's I can, I can tell you stories later. Yeah, yeah I was telling Mr. Hinman that I, I, I spent a few summers in summer school. <laughs> so did I, Don. Math was definitely a struggle, so sorry. Uh, the Algebra 1 was last revised. The curriculum for Algebra 1 was last revised in 2013, and both Algebra 2 and Geometry in 2014. So it's been some time. The current curriculum does not align with our vision of the graduate. Uh, historical SAT data demonstrates stagnant achievement. So three curricula were reviewed and assessed during a curriculum evaluation rubric. And illustrative math was recommended for open as an open source program. Professional development is planned for the Department of the Balance of the Year with target implementation for the fall of 2023. So we're, yes, Mrs. Carter. And um, Tim, you still there? Tom. 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 He's my, he's my new best friend, yes. because you know how I love math. <laughs> well, I don't. But when I listen to my student reps tonight, did you want to repeat what you told me about him? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Mrs. I mean, Carmody. he needs to hear this. This is wonderful. What, the part about the evaluation? Yes. That he should get all exemplaries, because he's a great teacher. Oh. <laughs> I had him as in seventh grade and eighth grade. Um, in middle school before he went up to the high school, and he's been a great teacher. And I was never the best, best math student in middle school, and I, he was always there in the morning. I would come in extra almost every day for extra help, and he was always there. And now I'm doing okay in math. So, good. so we may send Mrs. Job, Carmody right? up there. I know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So see, Dad, no, maybe if I, I don't like it. They, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Dad, if I had him for a math teacher, maybe I would have, uh, you know, done, you know, I'm just saying. Good job. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good job. Uh, the last um, item on the agenda for curriculum that day was Mr. Pepe and Amy Zapone. We reviewed curricular legal updates from legal counsel Shipman and Goodman, or I'm sorry, Goodwin, and the presentation included legislative curriculum mandates such as Native American Studies and Asian American and Pacific Islander Studies. Implementation targets span the 2023-2025 through that period. Many of the requirements in the reference model curricula has yet to be produced by the state and updates will follow. And these will be un unfunded mandates, right? Steve? Yes. Yeah. I, uh, right, I believe so they we have to train those teachers to, to teach these courses. They're all unfunded mm -hmm. mandates, as you can well imagine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So. Okay. Any questions? Oh, okay. Couple, couple questions. Um, yeah, I'm ready. So, two things of note. Um, the physical education, yes. um, and again, this this may be directed to uh, Mr. Pepe, um, but it's noted here that physical education one is a required course for sophomores. Okay, and I, I guess taking that as gospel, um, how does that align with our student athletes? Being a father of a couple student athletes, uh, I never understood necessarily why my son who is on the ice five out of seven days also has to participate in physical education. It is a requirement. Um, there are positives to it. We took a look, and if you look at the how Phys Ed 1 and Phys Ed 2 spiral into it, one another, the benefit and the idea um, is for our graduates, once we end up, once they end up leaving as seniors, to have something that they are invested in. So although my youngest is invested in hockey and may play for years to come, that's not the case for everyone. So the, the mandated coursework uh, exposes kids to different, all different types of activities uh, in, the, in the primary objective that when they leave our high school, they continue to be active and healthy. So although initially I struggled because carting him around all the time, uh, it, it ends up being a benefit for all kids and he enjoys it as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then with regards to uh, the math curriculum and, um, and Mr. Hinman, you may be in a position to respond to this. Um, I'm, I'm interested to learn a little about illustrative math and, and what that program uh, may mean for our students. Um, so in our research and looking at different curricular options, we looked at things that were um, highly rated by the company that's called Ed Reports. It's a third um, party company that works with educational resources and rates them in terms of the standards that schools are assigned to teach, as well as rigor, equity, um, technology resources, um, accessibility for teachers and students, and provides kind of like a baseline for you to start the process. Um, Illustrative Mathematics is also a curriculum that we're currently utilizing at the middle schools through in six through eight, and they are also implementing in the Honors Algebra One program at the middle school. Um, so we looked at Illustrative first because it is the most highly rated curriculum through Ed Reports on their website. They actually have achieved a perfect score in all of their three domains that they are assessed against. Um, and one of the really you know, kind of positives in terms of trying to move this forward quickly because we are in kind of a dire need of reform for curriculum is the fact that it is an open source curricula that will not have any real budgetary impact on the district. Um, in terms of instruction and students and benefits to teaching and learning, you know, our current curricula are not aligned with the vision of a graduate and they don't really provide resources for students to collaborate, to critical think, or to really have in-depth communication with one another about the mathematics that they're learning. It's almost skills that are taught in isolation that the students are then kind of expected to bring back up and almost regurgitate, if you will, at a later time. Um, illustrative math is designed around the idea of a problem-based curriculum where every single day, every single activity is embedded in real-world context, and it's almost created for students to have an opportunity to investigate the mathematics, apply prerequisite skills that they may have learned previously, and come up with their own ideas before things are formalized by the teacher. So they can even come up with some of these theories or even some of the processes independently through the activities that have been pre-designed by the publisher. Um, and every activity, as well as being that problem-based centered approach, also provides the opportunity for 
that critical thinking for that collaboration and alliance with our C's to help with the capstone project that we are also assigned. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, just getting you up at the podium, right? Clara clarified for me that um, it's not illustrative math, but illustrative, illustrative. math. Illustrative. Okay. Yeah. And just, just in you defining that for mm -hmm. me, are already started the process, right, of yeah. understanding what exactly we're doing here mm -hmm. um, with this program and, and what we're seeking to accomplish. I will um, say, so, uh, if I yeah. could, one of the other day I went to our middle school um, and I stopped in to talk to some of my former colleagues. And, you know, they're currently in depths of teaching these curricula at that level. And, you know, when we talked about it coming to the high school, they're obviously excited to see it matriculate up through those grades over the coming years and um, how the students are going to continue with it. And, you know, we talked about the benefits of the program. And one of the teachers kind of said to me, it's not about kids having the immediate correct answer to the question or the immediate correct steps that have to be followed to get to the right answer. It's about kids developing perseverance and the conceptual understanding piece to navigate through the mathematics as a through line and not just individual things that are taught in isolation. That's kind of what the curriculum provides. So you can go with me and we can be guests in your class. Mm -hmm. What? Did you want to ask a question? You want to do that? Joe? Don't you want us as guests in your classroom? I would love to have you as a guest in my classroom. <laughs> Anytime. Did you want to answer? My, my question, and again, like maybe it's, I actually have to go to one of the classes, but I guess <laughs> one of my questions would sort of see how this actually plays out um, it, as, as far as like in a teaching setting of, mm -hmm. uh, again, student of math, and I actually thought I would teach math one day, was again, very like linear, like step mm -hmm. A, step B, mm -hmm. step C, you prove the theorem. You know, again, like it just made sense to me as far as like it's very black and white. There's no. Yeah. So if so I can. It's kind of interesting to hear. I can well, provide you with like a long story short, yeah, really. Yeah. So each lesson, if you will, has about four different pieces to it. It has an opener. It has a, a beginning activity. It has an in-depth activity. And then it has a wrap up where the opener might seem like a five to ten minute question for students to explore that has nothing to do with the skill that they're learning but it's been created in a way to get their minds thinking about prerequisite skills that are gonna be applied in that actual lesson for the day. The first activity, about 10 to 15 minutes, might have you know, real specific questions for the kids to talk about to try to build ideas. So you think about 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes of kids exploring something, talking about things, coming up with ideas, even if they're completely wrong. And then a short period of time where there's a summary that the teacher kind of leads and formalizes what the true learning should have been. So it's not like the kids are just kind of coming up with things on their own and we're just saying, yeah, go with that. <laughs> we bring it back together and we synthesize the learning and kind of formalize with some instruction. The third activity digs deeper. How can you apply it in a different way? What does it look like with some roadblocks that might come up? And then in the end, there's for every single day, there's almost like a quick formative exit ticket that takes five minutes for the teacher to see, you know, our learning target for this day was this did the students meet that learning target or do I have to revisit that? And it's all prepared, aligned with the standards that we're assigned to teach. Right. If I may again. Okay. Um, Did you no, know? I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> in, in implementing this program, mm -hmm. what, what challenges exist on the professional development side of things? Meaning mm -hmm. your, you know, your, your colleagues, your peers as teachers, how how do we what exists for them to become um, uh, competent instructors of of this programming mm -hmm. with within our district and what hurdles do you see that uh, that exist in, in in trying to implement this okay. if I may um, so w one of the challenges with with any new curricula that shifts the ownership of learning to students is relinquishing the control uh, as a teacher. And so instead of a stand and deliver model, uh, there needs to be PD around how to facilitate the conversations. And we've, we've, you've seen a lot of this through our new science curriculum. 
and um, students learning by seeing uh, and being exposed to a phenomena and then trying to figure out how it actually occurred and proving how it occurs and the different theories behind. Um, that, that's a different structure in the classroom to know how to facilitate those questions, know how to facilitate the conversations, <laughs> and to guide the students to that essential learning, right? Because you still need that content acquisition. It's a different way of, of achieving it. And we know that a lot of time, that 99% of us, uh, and it's, it's interesting because a lot of folks will say, well, I'm, I'm not good at math. Well, how did you learn math? Right, because if you have a certain mind for math, it may come easy in, in terms of that rote type of, of exercise. But being able to take the concept and apply it to a completely unrelated initially activity takes the true understanding of the mathematical process. And that's what this is about. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, <laughs> it takes professional development for the teachers to feel comfortable to act as those, that, those facilitators. And to piggyback off of that, uh, and not to belabor this, because I, Pat, I understand we have you waiting for presentation, so I don't want to keep you too long. You know, being married to a, a district administrator who oversees math in another community, we talk about this often. Some of the pedagogical shifts is from the algebraic approach, we've, which you talked about, you know, and, and the teachers, the formula was always, I do, we do, you do. So I'm going to do an equation on the board, you're going to watch it. I'm going to put an equation on the board, I'm going to call up on a couple kids, they're going to do it, and then you're all going to go do it, you know? and. In, in certain types of math, that works, you know, when there's, when there's you know, equations to be solved. But I could even point now to uh, apps on an iPad where I can literally just write an equation on the app and it gives me the answer. <laughs> I don't really need to know that, you know, how to solve that equation, but I need to understand what's in that answer or what's in that equation, right? If you don't have number sense or conceptual understanding, which Mr. Pepe's alluding to, then the equation is just that. It's, it's, a, it's an equation with an answer. So I think that the critical thinking piece is really when you're working for a company, I'm just thinking right now out loud, you're gonna be posed with a problem, not an equation. And you have to figure out what is the equation going to be that's gonna give us the answer to that problem. I, I know I'm literally thinking about, they don't give you the equation, you know? And so that's where we're trying to get kids to have a conceptual understanding using real world applications and examples so that they understand when they're faced outside of the classroom and nobody's giving them an equation, what is the equation I need to develop here in order to solve this problem? You know. it, right, and that, and, and that was basically the, the, the crux of my question in, you know, in what hurdles exist in the professional development, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, I understand the concept and, and where we're going, and I love it, um, you know, because it does have the real world application, right? Mm -hmm. And our vision of the graduate, it is in align with that and it supports that. From a professional development standpoint, because we have teachers that were trained in the 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 exact I do, we do, you do. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Manner, what are the challenges in professional development to get teachers to move away from that model and to an open source model in it looks like a very finite period of time if so we're going to we, get this off the when ground. When you guys approve the school calendar each year, those August PD days are critical. And also all of those early release days, the Tuesdays that you approve, uh, which is that means the PD is ongoing. It's not just a one time training session. Um, along with the contractual after school meetings that they have as departments are all opportunities for the department to come together and maybe by course, whether it's Algebra 1, Geometry Algebra 2, look at these curriculum units of study and talk about how the, you know, the pedagogy behind it, um, how they're going to deliver that. So that collaboration actually that they're doing, that 21st century skill that they're you know, exhibiting is, is what's going to lead them to help make those shifts as well. Okay. And I can even just add a few specifics. And we did talk about that. At our PD meeting that we had last week, you know, I had my teachers with their first blush. That was our first opportunity to see it live. And as I was trained in implementing illustrative before I went to the high school, I actually taught a lesson as if they were students. So they kind of got to see it live and see it in action. Um, I've worked very closely with uh, Mrs. Zapone as well as, um, I can never say her last name. Baranaskis. Yes, Baranaskis, sorry. <laughs> um, because she came to us as an illustrative mathematics certified trainer. 
Um, so working together to kind of build a program throughout the duration of this school year to prepare us for the opening days next year to really kind of launch this. Um, designing materials, we have a representative coming in on one of our three hour release days from CREC, um, who is also gonna be implementing a PD just around the shift to illustrative mathematics, the challenges and how we can get there with the most effective use of our time. Okay. But it is hard. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Tom. And thank you, Mrs. Anastasio. Um, next up is our Finance Committee report. Mr. Chernowski. Thank you. So the Finance Committee uh, met in person last Thursday in this building. Um, we did discuss a number of things. The first thing that we had on our agenda was the self-insurance update. We didn't have any action items for that, but we did take a look at the, um, the net claims history from 2016 all the way up to 2023. Uh, just to help put in context what the, uh, the sh sharp increase in the uh, budgeted amount, amounts for health insurance that we have to uh, pay for here. Um, the recommendations are from that self-insurance committee are partially based on the uh, running claims history and um, the next opportunity for the committee to act is going to be uh, on uh, March 20th coming up here. So again, no actions there. Um, we do have another uh, action item on the, uh, for a bid award, number 2023-07 for lawn mowing. So we did, uh, we did present the uh, results for the bid for lawn mowing and trimming services for four sites, which also included the uh, optional debris cleanup for two sites. And the, the uh, administration and the finance committee uh, is recommending to award the bid to Wygant Construction for uh, Hatton, Oceana, South End, Thalberg, with uh, debris cleanup at Oshana and South End. And uh, Wygant is, is actually our current lawn vendor for the high school. And um, our director of operations, uh, Pete Romano, did agree that the company uh, will be able to provide the additional service at the sites and uh, provide the same quality of work that they, they currently do and uh, did at the high school last year. Uh, of note is that uh, one, vin one vendor did submit a bid that um, had some service and uh, invoicing issues in the past with us and uh, therefore we did not consider uh, them to be a responsible bidder. Um, let me see here for the motion. I move to award bid number 2023-07 for three years to Wygand Construction of Bristol, Connecticut for lawn mowing and trimming services at Hatton, Oceana, South End, and Thalberg Elementary Schools and fall and debris, or I'm sorry, fall and spring debris, debris cleanup and removal services at Oshana and South End Elementary Schools. <clears throat> Second. Any discussion? Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Oh, actually, I did have an uh, addendum on that, um, on one of them. I don't think it, it'll affect the motion, but uh, after we did post that, uh, that bid, the um, we, we did have a, a vendor for the Kennedy Middle School that originally agreed, agreed to a one-year extension, but we were notified that the, um, they did not wish to continue uh, their award. Uh, we did have one bidder respond for, for the Kennedy Middle School, uh, but the, the bidder's pricing was well above our budget for the services, so uh, we did not decide to award the, um, the result for the addendum. And so that site will, will have to be re rebid in the future. Um, next, we, we also discussed the uh, financial update, uh, Ms. Mellett, and um, we, we, we discussed the financial update for uh, this, pretty much the, the school district, right? Uh, we were, hold on one sec here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so we were reminded that the spending freeze um, has been in place since De uh, December 31st. And uh, looking at the numbers, we, we are gonna be looking at uh, projections for the end of year actuals to come very close to what we had originally budgeted. Um, we are currently monitoring some of the increases in transportation costs and uh, special education excess cost grant reimbursement rates and entitlement caps, um, the, uh, and as well as the, the additional 27th pay period for the June 30th for the 12-month uh, hourly employees. Um, we also had noted that the uh, Magnet School tuition account will end with a surplus of a little uh, under 34000 so 33800 and um, the pupil services department will be filing the excess cost update with the state on March 1st. I don't know if, Ms. Mello, do you have anything to? They, they count the number of the amount. Yeah. 
that's not so just a just a one one yeah. uh Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that was, yeah. Adjustment. Is 33,800 is the account, account number, number, not yeah. the amount that will be in there. We don't know that yet. Sorry about that. Any, uh, Ms. Mel, anything to add on that? Um, I was just going to say that the amount of the surplus in the magnet school tuition line is 130,000. And that just depends on the number of students that chose to attend magnet schools for the current year. And and don't forget about the uh, food services. Yep, that's, yeah, that's the next one here. What? Food services. So Ms. Held did also prevent the financial update for food services as of January 20, uh, 31st, 2023. Um, we also noted that the meal counts have decreased since uh, transitioning back to full pay. Um, we also did review the shift in revenues for, for the uh, seamless summer option reimbursement rates uh, for the fiscal years of 2021-2022 compared to the um, national school lunch program uh, funding in the 2022 to 2023 fiscal year. Um, the chart that we reviewed did highlight that the re reimbursement rates for the summer seamless option was uh, $4.31 just about for all school uh, lunches uh, and it went down to about 70 cents, 77 cents, sorry for the uh, school year of 2023 for students classified in the uh, paid lunch category. And so paid lunches do account for approximately 71.7% of the meals served uh, this, this fiscal year, 2022 to 2023. Um, we also reviewed the smart funds in the amount of $639,256, which were provided by the state to allow districts to transition back to paying for meals. Um, also held a general discussion, discussion about the uh, return to free meals approved by the governor uh, recently that, may, that might impact our school program. And uh, we, we are basically waiting to see, for, from the, uh, to see what the state government decides on offering meals at no cost uh, in the fall before we take any action. Um, related to that, uh, the governor did approve the return to free meals on February 14th. So, we are expecting the free meals to begin on March 1st, and the, uh, the program is going to be referred to as Smart Funds 2.0. That's all I had. Any questions? No? Thank you, Mr. Sharnowski. Okay, next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report uh, for the personnel report. Uh, Do move, I recommend that the Board of Education approve the personnel report as submitted. Second. By the Resource Department. Okay, I have a first and a second. Joe. Yeah, Mr. Um, Daranowski. Was the, uh, the actual personnel report part of the package? I didn't, I don't That's think it's attached. I didn't see it. The personnel report? I think it was in the, in the portal. It wasn't in the portal? No. Oh. Okay. Okay, I, yeah, I have a package, so. Here. I don't want to hold it up. So. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone? Um, I have a. Mrs. Clark, excuse me. If you want, I can go make some copies and then they can review it um, can while, the, copy. while the presentation is happening if anybody needs them. Okay. Do you want to do that? We can. No, I'm good. Okay. You're good? Say, so, uh, you don't have a copy. Okay. Mr. Pepe just gave it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to? Are you good? Okay. All right, so everybody's good? Do you want to I, I, like to like, see it? Yes. Okay. Here. There you go. Take a look. Okay. While well, they're setting up there. Where are you going? Okay. Now, is this me next, Holly? We're good. Hang on a second. Let's just hang on, Mrs. Carmody. Hang on. Okay, we have one other on. thing after this. All right. We'll let you peruse. Mr. Sharnowski just had to step out for a moment. We're good. Okay. Mr. Carson is looking at it. Mr. O'Shanna is She's looking at it. No, you don't need to make copies. Oh, you're good? Okay. Okay. Mr. Carson is reading it. Mr. Sharnowski just stepped outside. So. Oh, wow. Well. <clears throat> She's going to make it right. Do you want me to go? No. Oh. We have a motion. We, you have to wait, Mrs. Carmody. Okay. I know you're. Whatever you say, Mrs. Clark. You're I'm waiting so to do that motion. I know you are, but you need to wait 
because we're waiting for Mr. Sharnowski to return. Okay. We will vote on the, Mr. Carson is looking at it in depth. It's all good. We're taking a brief Wait, moment. Okay. okay. And actually we could vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. MIA. Okay. In the old business, we have town government communications. As I said, we have the district wide committee that's coming up. Um, and that's it. Mrs. Carmody, would you like to now make a motion? Well, certainly, Mrs. Clark. Thank you. I move that the Board of Education approve items 10B1 through 10B9 as recommended by the Curriculum and Instruction Committee. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Well done. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Great motion. Okay. It is. Appointment of the UPSU Negotiating Committee, which we tabled. The appointment is going to be Mrs. Carmody, Mrs. Anastasio, and myself. We have our first meeting, I believe, on Tuesday at 3.30 here in the Municipal Center, and I thank you for volunteering to do that. Next, new business, the Elementary Facilities Review. I already have this on Mr. Medancy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this evening we have a presentation for the Board of Education. This is obviously your first time seeing this information, but it's very much connected to last May's, if you remember, the enrollment study uh, and projected enrollment looking forward. Um, so the enrollment is half of the equation and the other half of the equation is building usage and occupancy. And we use this information for two reasons. Obviously, one, it helps this board to consider what recommendations they may uh, make to the Board of Finance and to the Town Council relative to future elementary construction projects. Um, most specifically, consideration for an upcoming referendum in November of 23 relative to a school construction project. As I touched upon earlier, we met with uh, state officials last week, the town manager, myself, Mrs. Clark, Mr. Romano, um, Patrick was in attendance as well as the representatives, the owner agency, uh, owner agents form Colliers. Um, so with that conversation, it was, it was a very good conversation. I found the state to be very responsive and willing to, to collaborate with us um, on some various iterations that we have for you this evening. So with that said, I want to introduce Patrick Gallagher from SLAM Collaborative and he is um, the lead, would you say, engineer, project manager, planner, planner uh, who presented this to the Elementary Facilities Committee uh, first, and then uh, we scheduled to bring this to the full board. Of note, beyond tonight, I do plan on, once the District 5 Facilities Committee is uh, formally established and up and running, we would love to invite the public out to a parent forum to digest the enrollment information as well as the facility information and do some Q&A with families so they understand uh, the scope of this project and the future of the elementary facilities in the district. And so with that, Patrick, it's all yours. All right. Thank you for the, the introduction there, uh, Nancy. Um, so yeah, just to kind of build on that, what is the purpose of scenario planning? So um, back in the spring, we developed our baseline enrollment projections we took a look at your existing facilities, how you use them, and the scenario planning process basically takes that a little bit uh, further and says, let's look at some different what-if scenarios. How would building usage look system-wide and at individual schools? And we know that you're contemplating um, some building projects, and so probably the most important uh, thing is that the scenarios help um, define what those projects will be. How many schools will you, will you build? Um, is there any facility consolidations? Because um, those decisions impact the enrollment at your building projects, which then in turn impacts your educational uh, program as well as the budget. Um, so this is a good first step as you kick off that uh, more detailed planning process. Um, I will kind of caveat that we are going to be showing some maps that have changes to the attendance zones. Those are more conceptual exercises that we have to do to um, project enrollment under each of these what-if scenarios. And so for folks in the audience or folks listening at home, um, these are all kind of in sand conceptual boundaries and any of those uh, changes to the, to the attendance zones will be have to kind of flushed out as part of your long-range planning process 
and typically, um, as part of a construction project, um, the, the boundaries typically will change upon completion of a project um, and are typically kind of finalized the year leading up to the occupancy of a new building or a renovated building. So we created a series of metrics to help us understand the pros and cons of different uh, scenarios. We, we developed a good, fair, poor uh, metric, and you can kind of see the details here. So our overall objectives were to improve efficiency and utilization within your elementary schools, uh, both system-wide and within each school. Um, balancing utilization, so we have kind of each school being used efficiently, not uh, some schools having uh, excess space, others may not. Uh, one thing we wanted to explore as part of this is um, changes to your middle school feeder pattern, knowing that uh, you don't have a direct feeder to your middle schools today. So if you change the lines in the future, it's certainly something to keep in mind to see if it's possible. Um, maintaining geographic proximity. We know you have some satellite zones um, that were implemented over the years uh, due to some enrollment pressures at specific buildings. Um, so looking to eliminate those if we can. And then finally, trying to minimize uh, redistricting impacts. So trying to disrupt the fewest number of students possible. And so for each of these, we have uh, good, fair, and poor metrics that we developed to kind of help us understand the pros and cons. So we developed um, capacity for each of your existing school buildings, and that's the maximum for each building using your uh, class size policy. And so as a target, we always recommend that 85 to 90 percent uh, of your max as kind of your ideal, where you have some headroom within your classrooms if uh, enrollment were to grow over the year, also maintaining you know, more uh, reasonable class sizes. Um, and so this just shows our kind of target range that we were striving for within each of the buildings. We also needed to make some assumptions for future building projects, um, knowing that you'd be able to kind of build the program from the ground up at these buildings. And so we developed uh, kind of three templates for three, four, and five section per grade buildings. Um, using that same methodology, your max loading levels, and then taking the kind of optimal range at between 85 and 90 percent. So I'll be presenting uh, kind of color-coded blocks, and uh, the colors represent um, what's happening to a building under a particular scenario, with the yellows being a maintain status quo option, uh, green being a build, and gray being closed. Um, and again, we were targeting that optimal 85 to 90 percent. Um, we kept special programs in their current facilities, and um, just for ease, any students who weren't in a special program, uh, we returned them to their um, district of residence, more just for statistical ease on our part. And then to understand the feasibility, we, look, we looked at five years out um, from our initial enrollment projections. So we're looking at the 26-27 school year as kind of our, uh, our viewpoint here. It's always important to compare everything to the status quo, so that kind of serves as our um, benchmark. And so um, this has you maintaining all of your uh, eight existing elementary schools at current capacity. And uh, at the midpoint of the projections, we're looking at a um, capacity of about 3,500 seats, just over that. Enrollment of about 2,840 students and overall utilization just at about 80%. Um, so this just highlights those three satellite zones uh, with stars on the map where we have um, two sent to Flanders and a third sent to South End. It's something we're looking to address in all of the scenarios. And then this just um, kind of summarizes using our, our uh, matrix of how well um, a particular option does at meeting them. Obviously, this does not uh, have any impacts to students since we're not changing any boundaries. Um, but we do have some, uh, we're not hitting our utilization targets both district-wide and at the individual schools. Um, right now, your schools are fairly even in terms of their usage, um, but different neighborhoods grow at different rates, and so we are projecting some schools to, um, to grow at a faster rate than others. Um, and this doesn't address uh, satellite zones or the middle school feeder pattern. So scenario A is looking at maintaining your eight-school elementary alignment. And this has uh, three building projects, um, Kelly, Flanders, and Deranowski, with all three buildings being roughly the same size as they are today. And then the remaining buildings would be in a status quo scenario. Um, we strove to align the middle school feeder patterns under this scenario, and then we also did some what we call pocket redistricting um, just to ensure balanced usage uh, across all buildings. So if we look at kind of our, our metrics here, um, overall our capacity is about the same. 
um, as it is today, some minor differences just due to the, um, the size of the new buildings. Um, and then our overall utilization is slightly higher at about 80.3%. Uh, this here just shows conceptual boundaries under this what if scenario. Um, we were able to eliminate those satellite zones, um, which you no longer see on the map. And we did maintain all those walk sheds to the existing schools. And one of the benefits to this is we were able to create a direct feeder uh, between the middle schools with your four northern districts um, going to DePaolo and the four southern districts going to JFK uh, with the middle schools being roughly the same size. This just shows the, the conceptual change areas. Um, if this were implemented, about 7.5% of your elementary students live within these change area neighborhoods. And at the middle school, um, oftentimes when there's um, changes to the attendance lines, it could be phased in over a period of time. And so if there are changes to the middle school feeder pattern that you do wish to make in the future, that could be started with an incoming sixth grade class to avoid having to move students who are already in those buildings. So just to summarize our feasibility, um, overall this would result in roughly the same system-wide capacity as you have today with those three new buildings at Dar uh, Daranowski, Kelly, and um, Flanders. We would have um, some balanced utilization in the near term, but that disparity would grow, again, with certain neighborhoods growing faster than others. Um, and it's a trade-off between uh, the utilization balance and disruption to students. The, the, if we move more students, we can get a greater equity in the buildings from a utilization standpoint. And that'll be something to weigh if those decisions are made in the future. Um, and so this performed well on some metrics, but not on others. And so kind of our next family of options um, takes a look at um, some alternative arrangements uh, with a seven elementary school alignment, um, which would close Flanders and com uh, complete uh, two building projects, one at Kelly and one at Daranowski. Scenario B, does not assume any extra space added to either of those buildings, so they'd both be roughly the same size. Um, and then, um, again, trying to uh, balance those feeder patterns for the middle school. So this would result in a loss of about 400 or so seats system-wide, most of those being this, uh, at Flanders. This, uh, if we look at the midpoint of our projections, puts system-wide utilization at about 91%. Um, which is uh, slightly above that target. Um, and so, you know, 91 is still pretty comfortable, but we were also projecting some further enrollment growth over the last few years of the projections as well. So just from a future-proofing standpoint, uh, um, you know, 91 is, is somewhat comfortable, but it, it may be tight uh, if enrollment grows further beyond that. Um, you'll notice this map has a little bit more changes than the prior map um, with the closing of a school that always results in greater disruption. Um, and so Flanders students were reassigned to Hatton, uh, Thalberg, and Kelly. And then some smaller areas moved to balance enrollment across all the schools. Um, we did test a direct feeder pattern here, but um, it's more challenging when you have seven schools. Um, with no extra space added in the north end. Um, and so it, it doesn't result in a, um, a viable scenario from a, a middle school enrollment standpoint. So this obviously has greater impacts. Um, about 21% of your elementary students would live in a change area. About half of those are um, Flanders students. One of the other considerations about not adding space to one of the other buildings is that you basically have to fill out, you know, available space at all of the other buildings. Um, and so um, you have to have other areas move beyond just the school that's closed. So from a metric standpoint, this does well on a utilization standpoint from a, a equity standpoint. All schools would be within about 10% of each other at the midpoint. Um, you're slightly above the overall target at about 91%, as I mentioned before. Um, the direct feeder, again, just doesn't work with the uh, three plus uh, four here with uh, no added capacity. Um, and then the redistricting impacts are obviously um, uh, about 21%, so not insignificant. Scenario C is similar to scenario B, except that uh, it adds an extra, um, extra capacity to Kelly. So Kelly, under this option, would become a new four-section per grade school. And Daranowski, um, again, would be a new uh, five-section per grade school. 
And so that larger capacity helps offset some of the loss of seats at Flanders and also provides additional space to move uh, students to, uh, thus reducing some of the redistricting impacts. So this results in about a 300 uh, uh, seat reduction in your overall capacity and uh, overall utilization is right in that sweet spot uh, between 85 and 90 percent. Um, again, we tested the direct feeder pattern for this uh, option as well. Um, all the options can remove the satellite zone, so I won't kind of uh, revisit that in each scenario. Um, but again, Flanders are, are reassigned to the neighboring schools, uh, Kelly, uh, Thalberg, and Hatton. Um, and then this does impact fewer students than scenario B because we have that extra space we're building into Kelly. Um, that allows more of those Flanders students to move to that building and reducing the kind of secondary moves that we have to do. <coughs> so just a summary of scenario C. Um, this does well on the utilization targets both um, system-wide and at the individual <coughs> schools. The middle school feeder pattern is still um, uh, not great, but it may be feasible. Um, one middle school will be larger than the other, so JFK will be about um, 80 students larger than DePaolo, so that'll just be a decision to kind of look at those numbers and see if that aligns with your teaming model. Um, and um, overall, this impacts uh, just under 20% of your students. And then scenario D um, is a little bit different. Uh, when South End was built, they designed a portion of the building to support an addition in the future. Um, and so there's a portion of the building that could have a second story added, which would add an additional five classrooms to that building. And so for this scenario, we wanted to kind of test a what if scenario of, you know, what if that space were to be built? And could that then allow us to reduce the size of Deranoski, um, which is your largest building, to a four section per grade school, which would be more in line with some of your other facilities? Um, and then this would also have a um, larger Kelly at four sections per grade. And so this would, this would have three building projects with South End Addition being the third. And then this would also um, have a seven school alignment with Flanders uh, closing. Uh, overall, this would result in a loss of about 325 seats today. Um, but again, your overall utilization is right in that sweet spot between 85 and 90 percent at the midpoint of the projections. Um, so similar to the other scenarios, Flanders would be reassigned to the neighboring schools. Um, this has some additional movement of students in the southern part of town uh, as we're looking to kind of fill out that new space at South End. And so we have um, so a larger South End district, which is in this kind of greenish yellow here in the bottom part of the map, um, capturing some of the students who currently attend uh, Deranoski. This has the greatest impact uh, of any of the options that we looked at. About a quarter of your elementary students um, live in an area that would be impacted. And again, that's due to kind of the, the infusion of space at two locations um, within the community. Um, so the, the need to kind of move to fill out the extra space at both Kelly and um, South End is what drives the impacts here. Um, so just in summary here, um, this is a scenario that does well in the utilization metrics, but at the cost of uh, greater impacts to students. Um, and then similar to scenario C, um, it's kind of a um, uh, in-betweener in terms of middle school feasibility where um, JFK would still be a, a larger than DePaolo um, by about 70 or so students, and so it would be something to assess in further detail whether that's feasible and whether that aligns with your um, instructional model at that school. And so this just shows a quick comparison um, with green being those that scored uh, in the higher end of the uh, uh, metric, yellow being in the middle, and red being in the uh, worst performing metrics. And so we hope that this is just kind of the start of the conversation. And certainly this is just one piece of the puzzle um, that you'll all have to consider as you look to uh, define your building projects. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Quick question. So how was the decision made? And again, like, it, was it just sort of a, um, 
Pick a school out of a hat type thing as far as what it would. Uh, I, I know it's oversimplifying it slate. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, but essentially, the, the looking of closing, say, a Flanders over, say, like an older building like a Deronowski, um, is that just more to show what? No, good question. So one of the things that we had done um, as part of, of the enrollment as well as the facility studies is uh, test sites. It's called, you know, so you look at the plot of land. Sure. You consider swing space, so is there an existing school there, and what's the ideal location within that site for new construction? Flanders actually is the worst site, um, given the shape of it and some of the wetlands that exist on it. Um, you would have no, the, essentially what we came up with is the ideal site for a new Flanders school is where Flanders currently sits. Yeah. Um, whereas Deronoski has a lot of land behind Deronoski, so you could create a new Deronoski and not disrupt the students that are in there, and then you know, switch, transition them into a new building um, and then decide what to do with the old building. Kelly actually was the ideal site uh, when they did the test fit of the sites and would easily house a larger building with little disruption and allowing for swing space. Um, so they, that's, that's one of the primary metrics. When they do the test site, it's not only for fit, they test for soil, contaminants, you know, types of plat uh, foundation use you'd want, fill that you have, all that kind of information. So a lot of that was kind of what we call pre-referendum uh, engineering level type of work that was done to kind of come to these conclusions. Okay. Well, it's a lot to digest. Yeah, it is. It is. Which is why I think even tonight, you know, my goal was to bring it to the board first because it's your first blush. It's your first chance to digest this information and it's a lot of information. Um, but I know we, we certainly will be on a tight timeline now leading up until May in terms of what the uh, town council will authorize the town manager to do in terms of pursuing bonding for a potential November 23 referendum project relative to, if you think back to the capital improvement plan that you adopted in January, we only had one school on it for 2023 because we did look at the cost of construction and inflation right now, and we knew that the debt service to the community couldn't tolerate two projects going at once and, and maybe even three if we, we you know went with a various uh, two other scenarios. So right now, um, within the capital plan, it is for one new construction, and our recommendation would be Kelly School, based on conversations with the state, the test fit, the enrollment, the swing space, and that being one of the older schools. But the great uh, Mrs. Clark had uh, asked to all these other people to uh, to be appointed from all the, which is really a great thing because this is a lot to digest. Correct. And we need to have everybody, you know, involved because. I, <clears throat> Because we will have public hearings, just like we did for the athletic visit, with the Board of Finance, with Planning and Zoning, with the Town Council. So for those public hearings, you know, people will obviously come forward with, you know, what their desires, concerns, or questions may be. And it allows mm -hmm. them to, you know, be informed because they have a member sitting on it who will be sharing out as we, you know, go through the process of community engagement. Have you ever been in a district when we've had, that's been redistricted? Yes. So you know how controversial it is. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know. Yeah. Yeah. I was I, I was the principal dad back in Milford in 2010 when we closed a school and they pushed all the students into my school. Um, I wasn't the principal there yet. They moved me to that school. They moved all those students from the closed school to that school, and then we added a third school to the mix. So we were like a brand new school that year. Um, but there was a lot of emotion because people have connections to neighborhood schools and history within those buildings and whatnot. And so we have to obviously make sure we no, engage the community. Is it the board of ed? I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. The final decision is this Board of Education making board a recommendation to, to, to the town. After we digest everything that... Yeah, okay. we make the recommendation to the town council. Yeah. Right. Now, one important, you know, um, comment, and, and Pat actually really explained this nicely to me when we were first going through this. We want to make sure that we separate the conversations around redistricting from elementary facilities projects. Right. Because you may have people voting in November 23 on where... What, what the redistricting ultimately does for them, you know? And what we're looking at is, is trying to create facilities that are equitable and energy efficient and, and whatnot, you know, reduced maintenance costs given the age of some of them, um, regardless of where students attend. Um, so the redistricting actually would not occur um, with the, reconstruct, the construction projects. The construction project, and this is something I had clarified for the state, if we build a new Kelly school, we can still redistrict, even if, let's say, a referendum for Deranoski failed. 
Um, cause we would at least have, which is why he had support that he touches upon the usage rate. We would have the seat space to still go ahead, uh, and fill the seats at Kelly school. If we were to close Flanders without redistricting and, and minimal impact on students, because that was only seven and a half percent. And that's reflected in which scenario? Uh, it's it, the usage rate and the, um, varies across. It went from 91. It was in the eighties, five to 90 for a couple well, so scenarios. Just, so that was scenario B then? Scenario C had the, in terms of the metrics, the usage rate was at the optimum level. Um, and, and so that was something. But, but that was essentially the brand new Kelly Daronowski would be. Would still be this uh, similar size. Um, okay. and, and, and so really and, like no actually building work being done to Daronowski, Flanders would close, but Kelly would be the, the focus of. 23 referendum. The, the new, yep. the new the building aspect. Right. So all construction would be focused on Kelly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But Joe, now they're building all these new apartments too. Yeah. Well, right? You, that hasn't been that. approved. That hasn't been approved yet, but yeah. we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Right. And, and and just my comment, general comment, right to the public, which you know, in accord with with Joe's initial question, um, is it, like. Let's just be clear and let it be known this is a feasibility study, right. okay? Yeah. No decisions have been made. Yeah. Correct. Okay? So it's not a decision on how did we get to this. This is just a study informational to us to be able to make the decisions, okay? Uh -huh. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, and then the second thing for me, um, and, and again, you know, through our chair, through our superintendent, is it's critical to the community and to this board to be able to make a decision um, where the state stands and and what their what their strategy, what their reimbursement rates are, um, and construction mm -hmm. ideology is going into this. So it it, it needs to be very, very clear and, and communicated um, at every opportunity what those conversations are at the state level so we have the information to be able to make the best decision for our district and our community here in Southington. I'm going to let you respond to that, Mr. Yeah, Williams. so I tried to get that appetite from the state and said, yeah. what, what is the appetite? Because when I was principal at Kennedy Middle School, they favored renovate to new. Um, mm -hmm. Slightly thereafter, they saw that the shelf life of some of the buildings was about 20 years because the infrastructure itself, the original infrastructure, wouldn't last far beyond and renovate to new. So then they were kind of promotive, uh, promoting new construction. When I finally landed on that, they said, we are absolutely not going to tell you what we prefer. It's up to your community to decide based mm -hmm. on the cost of the projects and what your community wants uh, and, and what they're bringing forward to us. Um, Obviously, when we work with our owner's agent, we'll calculate what the reimbursement costs are using the formulas that the state supplies for renovate to new, new construction, what have you. But we've learned some lessons, I think, too, from the middle school projects on renovate to new, um, especially regarding hazardous materials, PCBs, asbestos, that sort of thing. We also know that, you know, we need to do what's least disruptive, especially given the age of the students, and renovate to new. Having been the principal at that, that school, I, I could not tell you that it wasn't least disruptive. There was times that we had to you know, overcome some of challenges associated with those projects. Although they managed it beautifully at the time, it was a challenge. Um, and then lastly, uh, the time of the projects. And we know time equals money. And when you're renovating to new and your contractors can't have full access to buildings when students are occupying them, it slows down the length of the project considerably to the point that the two middle schools took two and a half years. Uh, whereas new construction, they can close out a project in, in a little over a year, um, which obviously you know reduces our cost uh, in terms of the, the, the time of the project. So um, all really good points. I know you know the industry well, you know, given, given your background, and I think those are conversations that have to factor into the, the community's decision. But I think the next most important piece is to invite Patrick back to a parent forum, or I would even say a community forum, because I think it's beyond the parents. Um, we have prospective parents that aren't, don't even have students in our schools yet. Um, and we also have taxpayers that care about what they vote for uh, at referendum and what's, what's going to be the return you know, to the community uh, if they support it. So our, our goal would be to share a lot more information publicly and be able to answer the exact questions, uh, Mr. Carson, that you have in terms of 
you know, uh, some of the challenges. And, and, and Mr. Bocheski's question is, how did you decide? It's a great question. Yeah, did you cherry pick this? Is there is there an agenda somewhere, or is this you know the result of some due diligence that resulted in in these scenarios? And that, if I was implying that, that wasn't my intention. No, no, no. I did, no I'm no, saying no, it was no, a good but, question but how? in how terms of how. To, it was a great yeah. question. I think anybody in an audience here for the first time would have that. Like, how, how did you, did you land on these this? scenarios? Yeah. And that's that was a great question. Hmm. Anyone else? Lots to think about. There, there is a there's a lot a lot to think about here. You're right. There is. Um, and we don't have a lot of time. And Patrick touched upon something that you all, you know, we, I think we need to remind the community right now, especially during this budget season, uh, our enrollment in Southington fluctuates and it's, it's not decreasing. In fact, by 2032, it shows an increased enrollment in Southington, not a decrease, which is mm. different than what trends in most of the, across the state, you know. Um, I had said to the Board of Finance at the last budget meeting, you ask me every year, we're down 200 students, why didn't you lay off eight teachers? And you all know the answer to that. We have 350 classrooms. You know, 200 students doesn't even net you one student per class. That doesn't equate to cutting a teacher because they're not all in the same grade level. They're not all in the same school. I, I pointed out to the Board of Finance that from last year's budget to this year's budget, we have an increased enrollment of 200 students. I didn't ask them for eight more teachers after the fact um, because, again, it, it's less than one student per class that we net. Um, you know, when, in, in, when these enrollments fluctuate as they do. Your incoming kindergarten cohort and your exiting senior cohort are what account for a large amount of the fluctuations unless there's a major development that opens. Mm -hmm. Mr. Darnowski. Yeah, another aspect of this discussion uh, we need to focus on is, uh, is the timing with the state. Okay, that's going to be critical. Yep. I mean, the referendum is, is one aspect of it. Uh, it. We basically know that come November, we're hoping that it's on the, you know, it, it's on the, ref, you know, it's on, on the, the ballot. Uh, ballot. Yes. Um, enrollments are increasing. The building is still going crazy here. Uh, they're planning on a couple hundred apartments um, in, in just in one section, yep. which I think it will, it will be approved. It will be. <laughs> um, I think we need to start doing some initial planning for redistricting because we're, we, we've got issues right now. Yeah. Yep. And, and those issues right now are, are costing us in transportation cost. Mm -hmm. um, so, th you know, we want to look at start nickeling, diming our budget. Transportation is a big number. Yes. And we could look at possibly saving a lot of money. Um, I'm talking you know, thousands of dollars yep. by just having it redistricting now. Mm -hmm. And when I say now, redistricting doesn't happen overnight. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, I've been through three of them in the last 30 years. And um, they're, they're painful. Yep. Very painful. <clears throat> and, um, but they always work out fine. Yep. And once they're done, everybody seems to be happy mm -hmm. and glad it was done. Yeah. But I think it's something that we have to start looking at right now. I agree. Hmm. Well, and, and just one last comment. I think, it's, I, I think it's important to remember, both as a district um, and as a, uh, as a community and taxpayers, that we um, we want to grow as a community, okay? Um, I, a, a lot of times, you, you know, these decisions are, are very tied in to numbers, right? And, um, and financial aspects of what we do and how we do it and when we do it. Um, but the reality of, of the situation for a school district especially a school district of our size with the number of schools we have is the greater the enrollment, the greater the economy of scale. So we have an opportunity if our feasibility and our projections are showing that our, our student body is growing, we have an opportunity here in front of us now to be able to make a decision five years that will have cost savings associated to it five years from now and 10 years from now in, in a greater enrollment. And it's, we shouldn't lose sight of that. And I think to speak to the work that Patrick and Slim have done at this point with that enrollment study in May, when he revisited the numbers um, with us this fall, he, they had that projection within five students of the 200 student increase. 
um, because they take into account birth rates and students that are number three and preschool seats and house sold and recidivism rates and all that. And so their projections have held pretty reliable um, since the initial enrollment study back in 2017, but very reliable this, this past year. So um, I think it's, it's a important information worth sharing with the community. And I'm going to thank you for staying extra no late problem. tonight. We tipped, our, our meetings tip don't run super <laughs> this long, but uh, I appreciate Oops. it. And we'll be in Just touch in terms of next right. steps. Sounds good. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, yeah. The last, well, we have um, the first reading of item C, D, E, F, G, H, and I are all first reads uh, for the Curriculum and Instruction Committee. Um, last item, the Leonard and Gladys Joel Scholarship Committee appointment. Do I have any volunteers, Mr. Daranowski? Yeah, I'll volunteer. <laughs> wow. Okay. Did I, did I say that all right? Okay, Mr. Daranowski, do I have any other volunteers? Mrs. Carmody? For what? <laughs> the scholarship. The scholarship. No, I'm not volunteering, Mrs. Clark. Thank you very much. Oh, I just thought I'd ask. I'll do as, it. As, you a, do as it? a former teacher, you don't want to. I've done it for a hundred years. Do you mind? Oh, yeah. You want to do it, Mrs. Okay. Anastasia? Okay, Mrs. Anastasio. Yeah, and Mr. Years. I know you have. That's why I just I said, <laughs> Mr. Taranowski, because you've done it every year. Interesting. Um, should I volunteer, <laughs> Mr. Williams, who isn't here? He did it last Absolutely. year. Yeah. Yes. I would volunteer. Mr. I'm volunteering, Mr. Williams. So Mr. Williams is now volunteered for that. Voluntold. Oh. He's voluntold. He was uh, he was on it last year. So, okie dokie. Good? It'll work. Okay. Where Mrs. Carmody. Yeah, okay. Um, communication from the public, a non-agenda item. You good? No, no okay. <laughs> Christian's waving. That's okay. Peanuts? Peanuts? Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to turn to Mr. Daranowski again. Item, uh, we, oh, I'm sorry. We have so one more item, one problem. more item that I didn't even add to my agenda. Oh. Mr. Oh. I know. Madam I didn't. I didn't add make it. Make a motion to expel student... Uh, Number 2022-2023-15, uh, as stipulated by the administration. Second. Okay. You're going to abstain? Okay. Yeah, abstain. Okay. James and Sean. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Abstaining also. Uh, Joe is abstaining as well. Move to adjourn. Second. Could you not get yet. that out any quicker? Yeah. What do you mean, not yet? <laughs> All those in favor? I'll miss you guys.